Good evening and welcome to this Good Friday service here at Living Word Lutheran Church on YouTube. I am pleased that you have chosen to spend this time in worship and um, just welcome you to this, this time here tonight. This is a service where we are going to focus on the seven last words of Jesus from the cross. And so I invite you into reflection as you hear these words and some short meditations on a various on the various um, words from the cross taken from scripture we'll have times of singing and if you do not have a bulletin i invite you to the website here there should be one on there and there will be moments of silence just to reflect on what we have just heard or have sung and i invite you into those moments of silence for prayer and just to soak in um, the words of scripture or the, the thoughts being offered. Following the service, um, we will have, and you can see in the bulletin here, there will be a very variety of things that will be happening and we will close with scripture and we will pray the Lord's Prayer together and then the service will end. There won't be a benediction or a dismissal. Um, the service will continue and it will continue on Easter morning. Uh, we have an in-person service at 6.30, a sunrise service, and then there will be a live stream service on YouTube at 10 a.m. And so with that, I invite you to prepare yourselves for worship now. Let's take a moment of silence and, and, as, and join me in the word of prayer. Holy God, we come to this moment here on this Good Friday to see the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son who went to the cross, taking our sins upon him, and he was crushed, he was pierced for our transgressions. Our iniquity was laid upon him. And he took those to the grave that we could be justified in your sight, O oh God. His awesome love is just mind boggling. It sends goosebumps across our bodies as we think about the agony and the suffering that he went through to save sinners, which we are sinners. And so I praise you, O oh God, for this awesome love and mercy and grace. Draw us into this story, to this, to this passion. May these words dwell deeply in our hearts. May we listen. May we receive them. May we be transformed. May we hear this anew as we have read these words, this story, many times. But may we not take this for granted. Give us fresh ears to hear this. Send now your Holy Spirit, O oh God. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let us sing our first hymn tonight. It is Beneath the Cross of Jesus. We'll sing verses 1 and 2.
<clears throat> A reading from the prophet Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This reading from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And then the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. The Gospel of our Lord. Holy God, I thank you for the love you've shown us to think that Jesus was despised and pierced for me. And you showed such great love for sinners were not worthy. We're not worthy, not even close. And without Jesus, we are lost. Oh God, heal us. May the light shine brightly in our hearts. Amen. Let us sing verse 3 of Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Now the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 19th chapter. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. 
they came to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he, was, he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me unless at all, unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at the place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was a day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to a place called, to, to a place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Jesus' first word, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. From Luke 23, verses 32 to 38. Two, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that's called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. <clears throat> it's fitting, really, that the first words of Jesus from the cross deal with forgiveness. Or it is forgiveness of sins that sent Jesus to the cross in the first place. When Jesus forgave the sins of the paralytic, the Pharisees were indignant. Only God can forgive sins. But Jesus showed his authority to forgive sins by healing the paralytic. Jesus routinely associated with sinners and tax collectors, saying that it is the sick that need a physician, not the healthy. 
Jesus exercised authority over demons, and they obeyed. Jesus cleansed lepers, making them whole. Jesus raised the dead, glorifying God. Jesus rode a donkey into town, proclaiming himself to be king. And now Jesus is being crucified. He has been beaten to within an inch of his life. He is suffering unimaginable pain. Jesus is having his arms stretched out of joint and large nails being driven through his nerves in his wrists and feet. Jesus is being hoisted up to suffer greatly. And he utters these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yes, they knew they were killing this man. But they did not know Jesus was the Messiah. Their eyes were blinded to the truth. In the words of Paul from 1 Corinthians 2.8, None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so, Jesus shows mercy to these sinners. He has showed mercy to you. These first words set the tone for the rest of Jesus' passion. May you see the light of truth, that your sins may be forgiven. Jesus' second word. Truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. From Luke 20, chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? We, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, he's done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you today, to be with me in paradise. It's no random coincidence that two others were mentioned being crucified with Jesus. This is not just Luke being faithful to describe complete, the complete scene around Jesus. The mention of these criminals sets the stage for the glory of God to be revealed. You see, crucifixion was reserved for enemies of the empire, threats to the kingdom. These were not sim simply petty thieves stealing a loaf of bread from the marketplace. You don't crucify someone for that. These two criminals were the worst of the worst. Those who were crucified were to be an example to the people to remain loyal to the emperor. Hence, crucifixions were very public events. Here we have two opposing narratives displayed in these two criminals. The first is the criminal who does not fear God. Amid his death sentence, he continues to mock Jesus. He fails to see Jesus as his salvation. The fixation for that first criminal is a worldly prosperity gospel view. Give me my best life now, not this suffering. And since he does not see and understand who Jesus truly is, all he is left with is bitterness and thus mocks Jesus. The second criminal accepts his suffering. He admits his sin and accepts the worthiness of his punishment. He does not plead with Jesus to rescue him from the cross. Did you notice that? But to save him, there's a difference. He humbly places his trust in Jesus to which Jesus proclaims salvation to him. Oh, what a vivid reminder to the sinner. 
Life is not always a walk in the park, but filled with suffering. Look to Jesus as your Savior. And be at peace now. For through faith in him, you will be with him in paradise. Jesus' third word. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. From John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, Behold, your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. We will now sing, I lay my sins on Jesus. Jesus' fourth word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Matthew 27, verses 45 through 46. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? 
Jesus' cry of being forsaken is not to be viewed as God literally forsaken Jesus. These words were spoken by Jesus. This is the beginning of Psalm 22. This is verse 1. The people hearing these words would have recognized them and thus would have been drawn into the entirety of that psalm. The psalm is an individual lament dealing with the suffering of the innocent psalmist at the hands of unscrupulous people and intense mocking. Eventually, the psalmist turns and looks towards vindication and worship. He laments his suffering, but knows in the end that God will be glorified. Many in this life simply lament suffering. Some turn to God in anger and shake their fists at him. Why, God, why? Some disbelievers mock Christians, saying, If God is a God of love, he would not allow suffering. All other religions have no real answer to suffering that gives any hope. Only Christianity offers the answer, and the answer is Jesus. He took the suffering that we were due, defeated death, and rose victorious. Because of this victory, you can lament, but do so with hope. Knowing that through faith in Jesus, God will vindicate you. In Jesus Christ, nothing can separate you from the love of God, and thus God will never, ever forsake you. In this life, there will be suffering. But the glory of God awaits you through faith in Jesus. Jesus' fifth word, I thirst. From John chapter 19, verses 28 through 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was about, all was now finished, he said to fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. We will now sing, Just As I Am.
Jesus' sixth word. It is finished. From John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. What is finished? From Revelation chapter 21, verses 5 through 7. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have his, this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Jesus' death accomplishes what the revelation to John reveals. God giving salvation to the thirsty and hungry sinners longing for reconciliation with God. It is a salvation at great cost, the life of Jesus, but with no payment due from you. It is salvation for those who endure in this life, who are looking forward to God's glorious kingdom. Many try to satisfy their own thirst and hunger with man-made kingdoms, but they will all crumble and fall. The Samaritan woman at the well wanted this special water so she would not have to keep coming back to the well in the heat of the day, in isolation from others. But Jesus proclaimed in John 4, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What Jesus came to do has been accomplished for you. He is living water. He is eternal salvation. He is the hope. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus died and rose. It is finished. Done. Completed. Your salvation has been accomplished. God's kingdom has come and is coming. It is finished. Amen. Amen. Jesus' seventh word. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. <clears throat> From Luke 23, verses 44 through 46. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the light's light, sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father! Into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And then from Matthew 27, verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. And the centurion said, Surely this was the Son.
we will now sing the first two verses of Alas and Did My Savior Bleed. In the Gospel of John, the first chapter, verses 1 through 5, and then verses 9 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Would you join me as we pray the prayer that our Savior has taught us? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 